is Brooke Kaplan. I go to the University of Toledo, and I work under both Dr. Jan Freyang under the grad student Alex Cimarola at the Wright Center for Photovoltaics Innovation and Commercialization. Some properties of the material that we're going to see in is it's very abundant. Uh, it has a direct band gap of 1.5 eV. Uh, the long minority carrier diffusion length uh, allows for longer carrier uh, minority carrier lifetimes. Uh, it has a high visible light absorption uh, spectra, and there have been magnesium uh, shocking devices up to 6%. And although this theory is wonderful, there's a lot of problems we have to get over in order to get uh, efficiency solved. Here is the close space elevation system I work with. The uh, substrate itself goes right here where there are 10 millimeter spacers. The 5N here is using phosphide powder, which 5N means 99.99 uh, .99 pure powder, goes right under here where the, so the bottom susceptor uh, can be heated up from like 620C to 650D, which is the range at which uh, zinc phosphide sublimates. And the top susceptor can also be heated, which uh, varies also with pressure to get different deposition rates. The, uh, there's a gas inlet that allows helium, argon, and oxygen into the, uh, the system. And uh, this is where you load it in. Motivations for this. Uh, overall, I would like to get cells that have some efficiency. Um, a lot of the devices that I've made have had close to no diode-like characteristics, no efficiencies have been made. Uh, there's a lot of shunning in the films, which I will explain later in the uh, presentation. Uh, there have been pinholes, recombination, and a lot of other problems with making these devices. Uh, the last time I did the presentation, uh, I had done uh, experiences, experiments doing uh, sodium doping, which sodium from the substrate I was originally using, soda lime glass, had about 15% of sodium in there. It was diffusing from the substrate into the film, causing it to have bad electronic properties. And on the right, you see X-ray using <coughs> Kappa K alpha ray. Uh, it had a 2 2 zero orientation for the different substrates I had used, which quartz had no sodium in it, mica had a little bit, and then sodium, uh, soda lime glass had about 15%. And it just showed that they were all in the same orientation, uh, even though they used different substrates. Right here are SEM images I had taken of the films. Uh, this one is the film on the quartz, which the uh, grains themselves were around 5 microns. Uh, the one on your right here is from the mica, which is a rougher, uh, rougher film, and then at the bottom is the film on the soda line glass. I had also done capacitance voltage mot shocking measurements to determine the uh, carrier <coughs> concentration of the different devices using the um, different substrates. At your top here, uh, you would use the most linear fit lines to get the carrier concentration. This is the one for the quartz, the device on the quartz, and it had the most linear fit showing that it had the most diode-like characteristics of the three. To your right, you see the device on the mica, which is very shaky, and then at the bottom it almost looks like an exponential decay instead of a linear line. You see at the bottom here the, dense, the doping densities of the, the three different substrates, and for the sodium, I wasn't even able to get the one for the sodium glass. More recently, I've been trying to make devices using uh, the uh, magnesium shocky uh, substrate configuration as well as the superstrate configuration. Uh, the superstrate configuration uses Tech 15 glass, which is soda lime glass with a transparent conductive oxide coating layer of fluorine doped tin oxide which acts as a contact for the superstrate configuration. There's also a highly resistive transparent layer which prevents the sodium from the soda lime glass uh, into diffusing into the absorber layer, which is zinc phosphide. Uh, it also, it's thin enough for tunneling and it also slightly helps shunning in devices. 
Uh, a lot of the samples I've made, especially recently, they just, uh, I've had a lot of failures. That's the problem with uh, experimental, is you have more failures than successes, but you still learn from them either way. Uh, a lot of the samples I've made have had too many pinholes, uh, the film not depositing correctly, whether it's so thin that it's almost transparent, uh, it just doesn't go on uniformly, and all that fun stuff. Uh, I've even had some like flaking off of the substrate itself. Um, with uh, the sodium doping experience I've been doing recently as well, there's also uh, speculation that the magnesium oxide may be on the surface causing it problems as well. Um, and more recently, uh, for some reason, I had uh, deposited silver as an omic contact and it evaporated off of the sample itself and got all throughout the system. It was but uh, these are three devices that I've made using different methods. These two were substrate configuration, and I used sodalon glass and quartz for 204, uh, using 10 angstroms of sodium fluoride just to get a hint of doping on the top. And for 209, I had used uh, quartz with EDTA or bromine. EDTA is to get rid of the defects on the top. Uh, magnesium oxide maybe a sample of a uh, the contacts you used that you can get off of the surface. And a bromine etch is used to also get more defects off and lower the resistivity. Uh, with 219 was super straight configuration, and I had done a bromine etch on half of the sample. And you can see that the parameters may be different as well. But because of the difference in parameters such as the pressure and the, uh, the heat that's going to the substrate, uh, the deposition time also varies, and this is used to make sure that the, there's around the same thickness of film for each of the samples, and each were annealed for a uh, different amount of times. The top one was uh, used for allowing more annealing time, allows for more uh, sodium diffusion just to see the effects of that. Here is some JV data from the first two samples I mentioned. Uh, you can see the series and shunt resistance. Uh, they vary. The series resistance is a lot higher than the shunt. And for those who are not in PV, to explain this, let me draw this diagram really quick. your PN junction right here. Uh, this is the solar cell current that you get from photogenerating carriers. And this is your shunt resistance and this is your series. And if you're, you want your series resistance ideally, you want that to be zero and your shunting to be infinity. Because if your shunt resistance is too low, it completely bypasses the PN junction. Whereas if the series resistance is lower and the shunning is infinite, then it goes completely through your PNN junction. And as you can see in the samples, all the series resistance are significantly higher than the shunt resistance, which is very bad. For 219, this one was interesting because for bromine etches, the resistivity is supposed to be much lower than the regular sample. Although the series and shunt, uh, the series is higher than the shunning or very close to each other, there is a huge spike in the resistivity for the sample with the bromine edge on it, which is not what is supposed to happen. So doing SEM images on the film, this is for the non-edged, which is a very typical film. Uh, I did a grain size analysis, which is around one micron for the grains, which is a little low, but this is typical of what it's supposed to look like with a tetragonal shape. This is of uh, the etch samples. Uh, you can see the there are like no grains that you can see. The grain boundaries have fused together. And you can even see on the picture to your right, taking a picture from deeper within the film, you can slightly see some boundaries, 
but the film is extremely defective and speculate it could be amorphous, which really damages the film. So for future projects, I would like to look further into the film with the bromine etched on on it. Uh, I'd like to do it again and then recrystallize the films through annealing and also do uh, oxygen treatments to passivate the films and see if it will help the devices at all. And as far as the sodium doping experiment, I would like to uh, make more devices with no sodium on there with uh, sodium chloride and sodium chloride to see the effects and hopefully get a paper out of the sodium doping experiment. Here's uh, the systems I've learned over the months of doing research. And I'd like to thank the Dr. Jan, Jan Research Group, Alex for putting up with me, and Rick, uh, Dr. Cavalli, you too. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. to your device uh, chart, please. Oh, oh this one? Uh, next one. That one, thank you. Oh, this one? Yes. Okay, let's go. Okay, so um, I just wanted to see, you didn't list your fill factors. I mean, they're going to be equally low because everything mm -hmm. else is. Um, one other quick question, or one other uh, Question comment. Could you go back to your device configuration? Yes. Uh, slide, please. That one. Okay. So which one of these had the silver evaporating? Oh, this, this one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it just it evaporated the uh, the silver right off of it, and there were just silver fillings in the the quartz tube of the system. Right. I'm not sure exactly why. I'm still trying to figure that out. But. And that was during the zinc phosphide deposition. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's never happened before. What um what temperature uh, does the substrate get up to? The substrate you can you can put it around six fifty. That's probably the highest. But uh, it's around there. Which high temperature uh, depositions have been done, and that's the uh, silver evaporating has never happened before, even at the higher temperatures. So it could just be the wrong combination of temperature and pressure. It could, yeah. We were still 200 degrees below the evaporation point of silver. But that's the thing is it's how you look at the actual surface itself and how hot that is. I mean, where's the thermal couple compared to the surface? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty hot. So yeah. you, you could have just had a very unlucky. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's thank for it again.